Dear Jesus, I, um, I don't know if I'm really good enough or worthy to talk about these incredible things. And, and I, you know, a man like me speaks in a stumbling way, and most all of us, as just normal, regular, fallen people, a lot more interested in ourselves and our glory, and, you know, those are the things that we, we tend to be deaf to hear when there are incredible things about you. And I pray, Lord, that um, in this first message and in all the messages, especially in this first message, um, I, would be, I, I would be a brain donkey, but um, your spirit would speak through me. It would be a, prof, a prophetic word, not because I'm any good, but because Christ is beautiful and Christ is glorious. And I pray that everybody who hears this message would see that would see that Jesus, you are glorious. And the great, omnipotent, omniscient, and most incredible God came down um, to unite himself to really poor and needy souls like us. And it is the most incredible thing that we'll ever get, have, have received, and will ever get. And I pray that we would not know that just merely as some idea in our head, but that your spirit would light that on fire inside of us and turn us into people who would love you with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength forever and ever. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So this first message, um, I'm going to title, What is Union with Christ? And so just what is it? <laughs> what is this union with Christ thing? And it's a really big question. Um, it's a big question. I went to Westminster Seminary, found out that it's a big deal at Westminster Seminary, and I, I literally read hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of, of different great minds um, discussing this, debating it. And I'm going to try to distill this down to you in the next 40 minutes, okay? So let's start with this passage. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ... I'll explain the color coding in just a minute, okay? If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Any of you familiar with this passage? Any of you studied this passage? It's weird. <laughs> it's a weird passage. So let's just break it down a little bit. First, let's look at the yellow parts. Look what it says. You have been raised with Christ, for you have died. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, just think about that for a moment. Um, not you will be raised with Christ? Isn't that the normal thing you think? I'm, and then you have died. These are past tenses. Do you notice? Past tense. You have been raised with Christ. So with Christ. This is what union with Christ is. You, you have died. <laughs> now, last I checked, I'm still alive. <laughs> and when you're talking about being raised, it's something I expect that's going to happen after I die. I will be raised with Christ into a resurrection like Christ. That's the promise of the gospel. So we tend to think about um, being raised is something that happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago. And then if some of you have good theology, you'll also know that you're raised like Jesus. But that's future tense. But that's not what this passage says. Isn't that strange? You think, think about that. It's very important. Something about how we're united has already happened. And it has already happened. And something about how we've been raised and now we die. That's the first thing I want to say, okay? Now take a look at the, the orange. Right? Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then it goes on to say, Christ who is your life. Now just stop for a moment and think about that. This is weird too. Um, do you think your life is hidden? I, I think my life doesn't look so very hidden. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a fairly good-looking five-foot-nine guy. <laughs> you know, I, I, I live in Cupertino. 
you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 46 years old. That's a little older than I'd like. <laughs> um, and I'm in fairly good health. I, I, I seem to have a gorgeous wife, decent job, you know, three kids that are, you know, most, most of the time they're okay, <laughs> all right? They're pretty good, and, 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 and that doesn't look like a hidden life, does it? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's your life, you, and this is a, a plural, you all Christians, you who believe in Jesus, who somehow have died with Christ and have already been raised with Christ, your actual real life is somehow hidden. You don't see it. And it's hidden, here's that word again, word again with Christ. With Christ. That's a, that's a two-word two way of saying united with Christ. That's what we're talking about here. And then it goes on to say, Christ, who is your life? Now let me ask you a question. What is your life? What's your life? Now, um, in San Jose, most people think my life is, is being an engineer or like, you know, being on the marketing team and then hopefully we'll go IPO and, and then I'll be worth $10 million and then and some babe will fall in love with me and then I will live on a yacht for the rest of my life. That's my life, or at least that's the life I want it to be, right? Or that's my life. Something like this, or maybe it's a little bit more mundane, you know, I, I'm a mom. Um, and I have three kids, and most of the time I'm loving to them, and every now and then, you know, they, they, they completely drive me crazy. And by the way, that's, even though it's mundane, that's, it's more important than the other thing, okay, ladies? <laughs> okay, it's a lot more important than the other thing. And this is what we think, but actually the scriptures say, Christ is your life. Jesus isn't just part of your life. He is your life. He is your life. And somehow that part is hidden. Okay, you're, you're catching all this? All of this is about union with Christ. Now let's go look at the... Um, uh, now, there's, there's just too many color codings, isn't there? Okay. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Now, I don't usually do this. I don't usually, this is a, I don't know what a translation of the Bible you guys favor. This is from the English Standard Version, ESV. Do you guys use the ESV? So we, at our church, we use the ESV. Um, I think right now, it may be the best English translation out there. It's certainly one of the best. And so I don't usually like to do this because I don't want anybody to have this idea that the, the Bible that you read is somehow not reliable. But the reason... Uh, you see, the reason I put those, those, uh, those two words in green appears. When who, Christ, who is your life, when he appears, you will appear. When Christ is there, when he appears, that word appear in Greek, I don't think that's a good translation. That's like saying somehow he, you, he, when he appears, you know, at, you know, at the end of history, then somehow you'll appear. That's not quite what it means. Now, it, that's true. It is what's going to happen is when Jesus returns to the end of history, but actually, the Greek word there is thanaroo, and you, you don't have to remember that, okay? All it means, I think the better translation is when Christ is revealed. When Christ is made manifest. Something about Christ you don't quite see. It's something, it's still part of the hidden, see? Christ is our life, and you don't see it. Your life is with Christ, united with him, somehow through the way you were raised and the way you died with him. And you, we don't quite see him, but somehow at one point, Jesus Christ will, will be revealed. And when he's revealed, your life will be revealed. You will be revealed. Who you really are, your life with Christ, that is what will Fanaroo will be revealed. You, your real self in him, with him, See, with him, union with Christ, and what it will be like, it will be in glory, in glory. That's, in a nutshell, all that we're talking about this weekend. Everything that matters in this weekend. And it's something that's hidden, and we can't see, and we normally don't, like, pay attention to it. We don't, we're like, we're not, we're not very cognizant of its importance, and my job is to help you to see something that's more hidden, and to feel the depths of its importance, okay? 
So let's go to here. I'm going to give you a word about this, uh, about a word about union with Christ. All those who believe in the gospel are united to Christ in his death and resurrection. So let's let, let me say this in a couple different ways. First, when you believe in Jesus, you don't just believe in some figure out there and you have this idea in your head. Now, a lot of people think that's what belief is. Some thought changed inside your mind, but that's not what the Bible says. Something happened to you. Something happened to your life, and somehow you have this fundamental, intrinsic connection to this person, Jesus Christ. You're united to him. And you're not just united to him in just any old way. It's very important that you understand that you're united to all of him, and if you're united to all of him, you have to be united to the part, the most important thing that he did for us, which is die for us and be risen for us. You have to be united to him in his death and resurrection. So just to give you examples, um, there are some preachers who just like to say, you know, Jesus is your best buddy, and he'll just be there for you when you have a hard time. Now, is that true? Of course that's true, right? But that's not the same as united in your death and resurrection. <laughs> Is Jesus just your homeboy, just a really nice homeboy <laughs> that helps you out when you're kind of like having a tough time? That's true, but that's far less than what the scripture offers. Or some people like to say, Jesus is the, like your life coach that will give you your best life now. And if you hang out with him, he'll give you this, you know, he'll get you the best girlfriend and get you the rich life. I mean, that seems to be, I mean, that's just a plain lie, okay? He does give you a best life, but not the way you think a lot better than you think. You are united to Christ in his death and resurrection, both of them. And everything that we're going to talk about this weekend is very important, that everything that when we're connected to Jesus is connected to both his death and his resurrection, everything that's glorious about Jesus. Because if Jesus is just a homeboy, then just go get somebody else to be your friend. If Jesus is a life coach, then just you know, go follow some self-help guru. But only one did for us what we could not do for ourselves, which we call the gospel. And he died for us and was risen for us, okay? So, let's um, just give you two quick verses to show you this. So, same, same book, Colossians 2. One chapter, this is a... I won't, I didn't want to pull out the whole context because it's hard, okay? So let's just pull out this, but trust me, I'm not, you know, cherry picking here, okay? Having been buried with him, again, past tense, you're buried with him in baptism. So something mysterious happened to you. You got baptized. I hope if you believe in Jesus, you got baptized. When you got baptized, I mean, whether it was the sprinkle job or the immersion, whatever, I'm not into that debate, okay? You're baptized with him, but the, you were buried with him. Some dying happened in which you were also raised with him through faith. Through baptism and faith, you were buried with him, raised with him. See, united in death and resurrection. We tend to read these verses and not kind of pay attention to these kind of parts, but they're supremely important, okay? In the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. That's Colossians 2.12. Let's, um, let's go to another passage. A little bit more famous. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? There we go again. You, you were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, there we go again. We were buried, therefore, with him. You see it, baptized with him in his death, by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, see the resurrection there? By the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, the way we walk, you're walking in the way he was raised. Something in us died when he died. And then if, you're, if you think I'm just making this stuff up that we're united to Christ, and it's just, here we go, here's the, here's the $500 verse. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see it? Both. Both. Now I want to teach you a couple things that is relevant to uh, union with Christ, but, um, but it's kind of a bonus, okay? This is just bonus, <laughs> okay? And the reason I wanted to share this with you is it will help you read the Bible. And when I learned this at Westminster Seminary from my professor, this is Richard Gaffin. He's retired now. 
Um, he's probably one of the finest professors uh, Westminster's ever had. He's got to be one of the finest Bible teachers I've ever heard. He's a little hard to understand at times, but once you finally get to understand what he's saying, which took me a, a few years. So I want to um, just unpack a couple things. What is the center of the Bible? And that's not that hard. Most of you guys, I hope you can know, it's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the center of the Bible. But Richard Gaffin would add this extra point. What is the center of the center of the Bible? What is the center of the center of the Bible? And in the center of the center is what Jesus did for us, which we could never do for ourselves. It's his death and his resurrection. And you want to know, at the, the, in the, all of the drama of the Bible, we are being united to that. At the center of the center, what God did all of creation for. Now, let me give you one more. Is it up there? Yes. In the Bible, the death and resurrection of Christ are always, okay, this is a, if you, this is a SAT word here, okay? <laughs> synodokic. In the Bible, the death and resurrection of Christ are always synodokic. Again, Richard Gaffin. And of course, um, don't, don't feel bad. I, I, I was in a PhD program. I'm like, synodokic. <laughs> I'm looking that word up. Here's, I, I'm going to give you the definition right now. It's a poetic term. It's a literary term. And here's what it means. It's a ref the reference is to one always implies the other. The reference to one always implies the other. And that means, here's what it means. Anytime you see in the Bible some reference to the death of Christ, guess what? There's always the resurrection of Christ. Anytime the Bible references and says something about the resurrection of Christ, it always implies and includes the death of Christ. Everything about Jesus is not... Some people like to say, Jesus, he is so great because he's a great moral teacher. Isn't Jesus so great because he ate with prostitutes and touched lepers? And that is really great. But you know what? Other people have done that too. <laughs> Nobody else has offered us death and resurrection, which just changes everything and gives us your life. <laughs> Nobody else has done that. And so... Every time you see this place in the Bible, I want you to see union with Christ. It's the reality of what Christ has done for us back then 2,000 years ago, but now it changes your life now as we're united to him. Okay? Are we following? Okay, that was the intro. <laughs> okay, this is okay. Shake yourself out. Let's get okay. Roman numeral number one. All right, why do you need union with Christ? Uh, why do you even need it? And... Um, this is a great quote, and I'm not smart enough to see this on my own. Richard Gaffin t taught me this, this quote, okay? Um, JP said that he, this is how he learned theology, reading this guy. This is from John Calvin, Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, one of the best books ever written on the Bible. Uh, maybe one of the greatest books ever written. <laughs> not kidding, <laughs> not kidding, okay? Um, here is how John Calvin put it. How do we receive those benefits which the Father bestowed on His only begotten Son? Not for Christ's own private use. By the way, in your, in your booklet, I, I, I didn't type not. That's a big typo. That's a pretty bad typo. <laughs> All right? um, how do we receive those benefits which the Father bestowed on His only begotten Son? Not for Christ's own private use, but that He might enrich poor and needy men. Do you see it? The Father puts gave something to Jesus, and he gave it so that he could give to us. And then John, um, Calvin goes on to say this, and this is the part I want you to get. First, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us catch that? That's a really, really big statement. Jesus, he died, he did all this stuff for us, but if he is apart from us, he remains outside of us, then it's sort of like he did something, he did something over there, but it's not in me. It's not connected to me. It's outside of me. And you know what John Calvin says? One of the greatest Bible teachers of all time, he says, then we're just hosed. <laughs> It remains useless. 
That's how important this union with Christ is. And then he goes on to say this, Therefore, to share with us what he has received from the Father, he had to become ours and to dwell within us. Now let me say something about this. Um, uh, a lot of people think that what you get when you believe in Jesus is you get something. Now most of us, you know, when we first came to Jesus, we didn't want Jesus for Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that true? Um, most of us, if, when we first believed in Jesus, we wanted something important that we saw that only he could offer, like forgiveness. You know, like, you know, JP said that you guys have been learning what wretched sinners you are. I hope after learning how horrible sinners you are, you're like, I need forgiveness. <laughs> I need some serious forgiveness. And so you want that important benefit, blessing, and Jesus can give it to you, and we go to him. So we're getting something for him. Later on, we want his guidance. A lot of times, you know, when we get in trouble, it's like, uh, Jesus, a new job. A wife, please. You know, something like this. Or how about heal my cancer? We want things from him, but that isn't actually, and Jesus gives us important blessings and benefits, far more than even that we ask for, but actually the thing that we most need is him. Him. And that he is now to dwell within us. This is union with Christ. You following? I, mean, uh, I didn't put this on your, on your um, paper because I wanted to uh, save it, okay? As I have said, this is John Calvin, all that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. That's a reference to Ephesians 5, you know, the marriage passage. Husbands, the head, the, the, the wife is the body. But then Paul says this really weird thing. I'm actually talking about Jesus and his church. I'm talking about Jesus. They're so, the husband is the head, the wife is the body, and this, it's a strange thing. They're so close that they're actually one flesh. But actually, I'm not really talking about just husbands and wives. I'm actually talking about Jesus and his church. And so it is true that we obtain this by faith, that we become one into, grow into one body. Yet since we see that not all indiscriminately embrace that communion with Christ. You get what I'm saying? Most of us just want one or two things from Jesus. We want something from Jesus, but we don't indiscriminately embrace union with Christ. You hear what he's saying there? That's, that's not how he talks. We don't just indiscriminately, give me all of it. <laughs> I don't discriminate between justification or adoption or heaven or forgiveness or like you'll be my friend forever. I mean, these are all the different blessings we get from Jesus. But we indiscriminately take all of it. But since most of us don't do this, we, no, we do not, since we see that not all indiscriminately embrace that communion with Christ, that's another word for union with Christ, which is offered through the gospel, reason itself teaches us to climb higher and to examine into the secret energy of the Spirit by which we come to enjoy Christ and all His benefits. So that's what we're going to do this weekend. We're going to climb higher and examine into the secret energy of the Holy Spirit so we can enjoy Christ, okay? Now, let me say one more point before we go to part two. Um, how do you think of your relationship to Jesus? How do you think of Jesus? When you pray, where is he? <laughs> let me ask you, where is he? In your mind when you pray, where is he? <laughs> is he... Um, when, when I was a kid, like, I'm saying, not like a little boy, but like, my prayer life was getting serious. I actually went through a really rough period in, in high school. I went, um, JP says I went to uh, Saratoga High School, but like, I, I used to live on the poor side of town. I don't know if, you, if you don't know, Saratoga's rich. Then like, my parents wanted me to go to a good high school. And then we went to Los Gatos High School because we thought we were going to go to that neighborhood. And... I experienced culture shock. I experienced like racial, <laughs> like being a racial mind. Everybody was white and rich. I was like Asian and I thought I was middle class, but I found that I was poor. <laughs> I was like, I guess I was poor, right? And I felt totally isolated. And for one whole semester, I was totally miserable. And then we didn't move to Las Gatos, and then we moved to Saratoga. 
And those guys were richer than the guys in, <laughs> in Los Gas, and everybody was white, even more so, and I was even more of an outcast, and it was in the middle of freshman year, horrible. And so I was deeply lonely all freshman year, and I was pretty lonely most of sophomore year. And you know what I did? I cried out to Jesus. That's what I did. Because, like, who can help me? Who can help me? I guess Jesus. You know how I thought about him? I thought about him as way, 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 way up there. And I'm some schmuck, six, 15, 16 year old down here. Is that how you think about him? Is that how you think about him? Some of you think about him as far from you, and maybe some of you think of what he has done for you is maybe only, you know, is not part of you. It's not part of actually inside of you. It's like he did something, and I'm far away from him, and what he did is kind of like not actually inside of me or only kind of sort of in me. I, I have plenty of members of my church, um, when they pray and they have a serious prayer request, they, they go, Pastor, can you come and pray for me? Because they have this idea that I'm some kind of holy man, and they, that they're this kind of like schmuck, like, like, like D minus Christian, and I'm sort of like a B plus Christian at least, or maybe like an A Christian, and they're like a B minus Christian. Jesus is super up there, and I'm sort of like, you know, closer. <laughs> and so I, I don't debate their theology at that moment. <laughs> I just pray for them, okay? <laughs> but I, I know what's going on. Are you like that? I bet you you are. A lot of people are like that. That's what this retreat is about. If this is um, what it's about, this retreat is to combat this lie. Because what union with Christ says is not that he's way, way, way up there and barely notices you, is he's united to you. He's not even like right here. He's like, he's closer than your wife. He's even closer than you are to yourself. That's what we're talking about, okay? Is this of interest to you? I hope so. It's really important. You know, change, it could change your life. Okay, let's go to Roman number two. What is union with Christ? So, let's, uh, let's unpack this a bit. What the heck is it? <laughs> what is it? All right. Um, I'm going to offer you a couple of... Uh, words here. Uh, these are technical words, but and you don't have to remember it. You just need to remember the basic ideas. Is it forensic? Forensic. Or is it renovative? Union with Christ, is it forensic? Or is it renovative? What does that mean? Okay, let's, okay, uh, all of you are going to take the SAT in the next couple of years, or you, 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 could, you know, I helped you here, okay? Um, forensic is just a term that means legal. I, I don't know why theologians like to use another word when they can just say legal, but they, they like to use a different word. <laughs> but uh, forensic is a, is, a, is, a, is a fancy word that means legal. Do you know that you can have a legal union with somebody? It's a legal thing. It's real, but it's not something you could like feel. <laughs> it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a conceptual idea that the law places upon you. You guys understand this? So. Um, Okay, there's a lot of confusion today about marriage in our culture. Oh, boy, is <laughs> a lot of confusion today about marriage, okay? That's an understatement. But there are people today who think, hey, we fall in love and let's live together, right? And then they live together, and then after living together for two, five, ten years, they say, you know, we're married. No, you're not. You're not married. You know why? Because it's a legal, it's a legal union. In order to get married, by law, it must happen. The law recognizes that I'm this person who's now intrinsically connected by law to this person, Grace. So if you are living with your boyfriend and you call yourself his wife and he calls yourself your husband, and then let's say he gets into a car accident and dies, God forbid. Let's say that happens. And then you show up and say, I'm his wife, and I get to inherit, you know, he's got a big old pension from his work, I get to inherit that pension. You know what the government's going to say there? You know his wife. There was no legal union. You, you hear what I'm saying? 
And then guess what? When his, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, bro brother, who's like some deadbeat who never worked a day in his life, wants to show up and you know, steal that money for himself, he's like, I'm his brother. I should inherit that pension and that money. Guess what? If you're just his girlfriend, you are never legally united to him, you're going to lose. <laughs> There's no legal union. So um, why does this matter? Because some people, when they think about this union with Christ, they think that we're united to Christ, and there's some kind of like, what is this? Is there some kind of like special force between me and Jesus? Like the whole, you know, like some kind of like special like, like a force, like something like between like Star Wars, like, uh, you know, like the force comes out of you and is connected to, to the other yeah, Jedi or something like this. And so there are a lot of people who are like, oh, yeah, I don't like this, but they, oh, but it's legal, I get it. And what they're what they're generally referencing here is justification. What is justification? If you, I hope you've been taught this, but if you haven't, here we go. It's that before the law, have you obeyed the law? When you, are you righteous under God's law? And when he judges you, will you be just, declared just under that law? Or will you be declared guilty and condemned? See, just and then accept it, or we be declared guilty and condemned. And here is where the legal union with Christ is so important. Because I hope you, got, you and all I know, if you, go, you want to stand before Jesus, which is the judge, and he asks, how did you do under my law? You, you, all, you and I are all going to know, oh gosh, door number two to hell, that's where I'm going to go. <laughs> right? As long as it's on my righteousness, and my, and my performance, we're going to the bad door. <laughs> but here's, if you're united to Christ, and he's your Lord, legally you're united to him, his righteousness is credited to you or imputed to you. It's not your actual righteousness, but it's his righteousness, it's, it's credited to you. And some people go, well, that's not a real thing. Yes, it is. It's not really your righteousness, but it's a real thing. Because let's put it to you this way. Um, let ladies, let's say, you know, you, you, you flunk out of college and somehow you, you, you meet some guy, you know, at the local singles bar. He turns out to be, you know, like dot-com, you know, millionaire, billionaire. And for some reason he likes you. <laughs> and then he marries you. <laughs> he marries you. But your whole life you were poor. Maybe you did drugs. And, you know, you, you robbed from your parents. Your parents abandoned you because you were a horrible daughter. You dropped out of school. You, like, slept around, did drugs and all this ridiculous stuff. But somehow you married a billionaire. <laughs> Legally, guess what? That billion dollars is your money. You get it? It, it's, it wasn't actually your money. But now you're legally united <laughs> to the billionaire. That's your money. <laughs> That's what justification tests. That's forensic union. And when some people preach the gospel, they emphasize the justification benefit, which is absolutely glorious and absolutely needed. It's utterly of grace. And I hope you've heard this message. If you've never heard this message, you just heard something incredible, right? And if you have heard this message, I hope you want to hear it a thousand, thousand more times. That's not enough. That's not all there is. Now, there's the other side. Now, some people go uh, down this road. So, by the way, the forensic side, just give some, some examples who, who tend to think of union with Christ primarily in the justification. It's sort of like Lutherans or a lot of Reformed churches or some Calvary chapels and, um, and certain, certain people who that like to call themselves Reformed in their preaching. They it's particularly lean toward this part of union with Christ. And they think this other part, it seems a little too weird and foo-foo that we're going to have some kind of connection to Jesus. But there's another set of Christians. They say, if you're united to Christ, I need some power. <laughs> I'm too messed up. Like, didn't you notice, like, last week, like, I was like, there was demonic possession in my life. I was like, Ugh! I was foaming at the mouth, and I was like, I, I, was, I was cursing the name of Christ. And, and then last week, I was doing drugs, and, 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 I, and, and, you know, who knows what kind of diseases I have in my body. And so they tend to go to churches that, you know, we tend to call Pentecostal or Charismatic. And then when they think about Christ and being, and they don't necessarily call it united with Christ, you know what they want? They want some power. I need some power to come to, and renovative means exactly what you, you guys ever watched like um, these uh, TV shows 
like, uh, you know, um, the one that my family likes to watch is Property Brothers. You guys watch Property Brothers? Everybody watch Property Brothers? Oh, yeah, a couple fans. All right. You know, it's these shows where, you know, these people buy this really dumpy house. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a horror. They just show you the house, or sometimes they, there's a person, and they say, oh, my house is driving me nuts. And you, and you find out that their washing machine is right in, 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 the, in, the, in, like, in their backyard or something. And then you have to go through this horrible kitchen to get to their washing machine. And then they have, like, three kids running around, and it's dangerous. And they go, help me, right? And, you know, and what they do is they renovate the house. And what starts off ugly and horrible turns into something magnificent and beautiful. That means somebody has to get in there and fix stuff. Somebody in there has to clean out the garbage in the house and fix it, renovate it. Power has to actually happen. And so the people who tend to mainly preach the, 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 the forensic side, they're offering you a grace. It's all what Christ did, not what you and I did. Beautiful. But if that's all you got, then then how am I going to live out my life? And then we keep falling down and we keep sinning. I guess I don't have much power in my life. And then people get, then they just feel like it's just on me. Jesus far up there, unforgiven, justification, same problem, way up there. And I'm just kind of down here doing my best. And, I, you know, I keep, I keep, you know, being super angry at my children. Uh, I have this temptation to hit my wife. You know, I, I, you know every day I imagine, you know, um, sticking it, you know, shooting my boss. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I say certain words out of my mouth at certain skin colored people on the road when I'm driving, and I can't stop doing this. <laughs> right? I'm sure there's nobody in this room. None, none of you are like this, right? There's just only holy people in this room, right? And, and there are people who say, I need something more powerful. And is Jesus going to renovate me? Something in there is going to. And that's the part where most people talk about is sanctification. Some people love the Jesus who justifies us. Union with Christ is justification. Some people say, oh, they love the Jesus who changes me. It's sanctification. But actually, let me give you, is it, is it renovative or is it forensic? And the answer is yes. It's all of it. Actually, it's more. So let's, let me give you another piece of um, language here. The other language sometimes you hear is covenantal union. It's covenantal. Okay, now that's, that's actually better. It's a bigger word. But what I've found is that most people don't know what covenantal means. Okay? So like, but the problem, the reason it's covenantal is hard to understand is because it's a multifaceted concept. The way I like to put it is that there are three, there are three partners in a covenant. There's God, and then there's two persons in a covenant. But a covenant, is it legal? Is it renovative? Or is it a relationship? Because the part that's a covenantal union emphasizes there's a new relationship and a new identity. So let's go back to the marriage example again. Um, I married this you know, gorgeous woman named Grace Kim, and then she changed her name to Grace Park. Even her name changed. Her identity changed. You get it? And then now, I'm not just some guy. I, I wear one of these. And everywhere I go, women go, oh, he's, not, he's taken. Too bad. <laughs> when I say that to my son, my, my son goes, I go, oh, let's see. You know why I wear this, son? So that when women look at this, they, I know they'll get really you know, upset that I'm taken. But it's good. It's good. It's to protect you. And then my, my, you know, my son, he says, Dad, you're hilarious. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> uh, yeah, nice sarcastic sense of humor that he gets from me, okay? Um, but covenantal union. Is it the covenant with Christ is what gives you justification? The covenant with Christ is now he pours out his spirit and he puts his heart into you and now he changes you, he renovates you, sanctification. But it's even more than that. You know, he gives you a whole new relationship. The term that the theologian like to use is he adopts you. And now you're not just a person who is dealing with God's laws and trying to become a better person and try to get sanctified and make it to heaven, but now you actually don't just call God God. God is your father. He's your Abba. And listening to uh, JP's children calling him Abba today, you know, all the way up here, I was like, that's, uh, I was thinking about Abba Father. 
That's all of us. Just like JP and Jamima's children call him, you know, call him like Appa, that's what we call him. And that's no kidding. That's all part of the union. And there's even more things. How about his very presence? You know, I'm, I have a covenantal union with my wife. Is it just a legal thing? Do you know the government only cares about the legal part? They don't actually care if I am nice to my wife. <laughs> Go home. They just care that, like, that's who you are. You know, d d d like, your property is with hers. She belongs to you, all that other kind of business. But if at home, if I punch her in the head, but, like, she never says anything about it in public, the government doesn't touch it. You know that? But, because they only care about the legal part. But it's all of it, legal, renovative, relational. There's a presence. You feel this? I have a relationship with my wife, and um, I love, love, love that she's here. Part of it is that now you will, like, you will meet her, and then you will go, oh, he's not just some nerdy guy who talks too long. Look, he's got that really sweet wife. He's, he can't, he got to be, he got to be more interesting than that, okay? Um, but, but, but when she's gone, when she's not there, you know what? I feel the lack of her presence and her power. You know that? You know that? You know that? I do. Um, that's why when people get divorced, they think they can just start a whole new life, but then they find out that they're like half of them is gone. It looks like they're the same, but their life was hidden in a covenant with somebody else because they're united to somebody else, and then that person who's indwelling them was ripped out of them. Now, I'm not trying to say anything. If some of you are divorced, you probably know what I'm talking about. But that's why it hurts. There's a presence with power. And there's one more thing that you get. You get a whole new nature, which I don't even think marriage can't give you that. But all of this is part of what the Bible calls covenantal union. But again, in many churches, they only just emphasize one of those five things. And that's not enough. It's sort of like only giving you a piece of it. And um, there's this great term, there's this great uh, sentence that John Calvin says. He says, um, we can't only just receive justification and not sanctification. It's not just that justification is by grace. Guess what? Sanctification is by grace. Did you earn your getting adopted? You didn't earn that. That was by grace. <laughs> did the power that comes into your life by his presence, did you earn that? Did you somehow, okay, I'm going to memorize, I'm going to read the whole Bible, Jesus, and I'm going to go to every, every church every single week for 52 weeks, and I will tithe, I will memorize the Lord's Prayer, and I will just be a super good person and stop looking at porn, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go on the mission team and all that kind of stuff. And then some of you earned his power? It's strange, all the people who have that attitude seem to not have his power. <laughs> because that's not how you get it. <laughs> it's by grace. And what John Calvin says, if you think of Jesus and you're only going to get a part of him, you're only going to get the, there are people who literally only want the justification. They want the forgiveness. That's like, I look at that and like say, oh, they want, they just want the forgiveness so then they don't have to work too hard to grow in their holiness. They essentially want, you know, a, a life, lifelong get out of jail free card. And, oh, I'm forgiven. Ah, you know, it's, it's like, okay, I'll be okay at the end there, and I'll be a really crappy Christian. I know, but I get out of jail free card. It, you know, like, so they want only a piece of Christ. And, you know, or some people just say, give me the power, Jesus, give me the power. And then they've never heard about justification. And then they feel that like they have to constantly earn Jesus' power because they never heard there was justification. See? And you know what John Calvin says to this? If you're doing this, it's like you're trying to break Jesus Christ into pieces. We are united to the whole Christ, all that he has done for us. Otherwise, you're like trying to break him up into pieces. You're not get, that's not right. And you will not have the power of Christ if you're trying to break him up into pieces. Okay. As usual, I'm going too long. Let's um, Covenantal union, one more term I'm going to throw at you, which is mystical union. So if you ever read these great theologians that have studied this, they, they say, yeah, oh, you know, it's not just a legal thing. No, it's not just a conceptual thing. It's not just a good fuzzy feeling that he's there. You really are, re it's a real thing. You're really united and connected to him, and he's not just way up there. Somehow he's really close, but it's mystical. <laughs> and you know what mystical means? 
we don't know what it means. <laughs> mystical means we don't know. Mystical means mysterious. So we just have a word called mystical, which is the same as mysterious, mysterious, mystical, we don't know. But it's real. And I don't think it's quite good enough. And I learned mystical union when I was a young man. And then, you know what, I kept, so you know, I'm 15, 16 years old. I really learned theology, so I'm like a 21-year-old. Oh, mystical union, what is mystical union? And then I, I, I would look up the word mystical, and, and then I would go to these theologians and read the discussion under mystical union and go, huh, you don't know. I'm not getting anything out of this. And then I would continue when I think about Jesus. He's still way, way, way up there. And I don't have much power and strength to live down here. Hmm. Now, what I want to offer you is the answer I received, which has helped me tremendously. Okay? And it's this. The Holy Spirit is the bond of union with Christ. Mystical union sounds like some kind of speculative, fancy little concept. Right? It's, like, it's like some Silicon Valley guy can come up with some special little word, and now we think there's some kind of special little concept out there. And some people think, well, that's like a theolo theologian doing the same kind of thing. You know, my professor Richard Gaffer says, it's not speculative at all. You are bonded to Christ, and there's no speculative, and there's no kind of like strange, weird, mystical force. It's a very, very real power. And you know what that is? It's the Holy Spirit himself. First Corinthians 15, verses 44 and 45, and um, I, I, <laughs> I'm always a little hesitant to go over this verse because it's so wild. This is, from those of, for those of you, this is right smack in the middle of a discussion on the resurrection. It's right in the middle of a res discussion on the resurrection. And this is what he says, it that is our life is sown a natural body. That's what you and I have right now, a natural body. But it is raised a spiritual body. When you're resurrected, you're going to get this strange thing called the spiritual body. Now, just stop and think about that for a moment. Isn't spiritual not physical? But a body is physical. But you're going to have a physical body that's spiritual. I don't get it. That's the promise of the Bible. You're going to have a physical body, which the Bible calls spiritual body. That's the resurrection. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first Adam, first man Adam, became a living being. That's, that's our forefather Adam. He lived. You and I have that same kind of Adamic, a, a, you know, Adam-like humanity as him. And we have a living, you know, it says, the scripture said that he breathed life into Adam, and then this dust started to you know, live. That's us. But guess what? This dust dies. And then he says, the last Adam, and you know who the last Adam is? That's Jesus. And the last Adam is not just Jesus, just the person who teaches. It's a resurrected Jesus. It's a new kind of Adam. Adam is the first of his kind. You know what an Adam is? There's another, a last Adam, who is the first of his kind. And you know what he became when he was resurrected? He became this weird phrase, a life giving spirit. And it's upon this verse that John Calvin says this. So he goes into this whole discussion in book three, point one, and for, for those of you who are a little bit more nerdy, it's the John McNeil translation, okay? There's the, there's the page if you want to know it, all right? Uh, you know, I, I thought JP might appreciate that, <laughs> that reference there, okay? Page 538 for JP and a few of you like him, all right? Here's how John Calvin said, to sum up, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. Now let me just say a couple more things. Um, of the Spirit. So Jesus became a resurrected man and somehow he became a life-giving spirit. I'm going to come back to this verse in just a moment. And that spirit binds us to him. What is that spirit doing? It's connecting us to this new Adam, this new first of his kind kind of humanity with this weird body that's spiritual but it's physical. A spiritual but physical body that conquers all death and cannot die. 
Now, every, t- every place in the Bible that says something about of the Spirit, you know what it also means? In Christ. And every place in the Bible that says, you are in Christ. He says it all the time. Paul says it all the time. We are in, in Christ. You know what in Christ means? Union with Christ. In Christ means you indwell Christ, or Christ indwells in you. It's just like John Calvin talks about. We didn't just get something from Jesus. We got Jesus, and he came to dwell in us, with us. In Christ is union with Christ. So somebody was like, where in the Bible is that union with Christ? Everywhere. <laughs> All throughout the New Testament. In Christ, everywhere. And then it, everywhere else, where it also is something about the Spirit. That's all union with Christ, too. Because there is a person, Jesus Christ. He's not just the Son of God, God. He's a human being, so he's a God-man. And he's a human being that was like us, but now has conquered all of death and sin. And now we're connected to that new kind of humanity. And being connected to that new kind of humanity, the Holy Spirit is putting that new humanity and connecting us to that death-conquering, sin-conquering humanity. So more language. First Adam, that's the flesh. That's another way the Bible talks about it. Flesh. Um, I, I, this is the way I like to teach you. Have you guys ever... You're in the flesh, but if you believe in Jesus, you're in the spirit. In the spirit, guess what that means? United to the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Union with Christ. In Adam equals flesh equals death, but... The last Adam equals life-giving spirit. And in the last Adam is, guess what? In Christ, life-giving spirit, resurrection Christ, your life. Your life hidden with Christ, as Colossians 3 says. The life that you don't see, that's hidden with Christ, where you died and you were raised, all of that is with the new last Adam. That's union with Christ. Um... I, you know, you know, let me just give you the verse trust, but I won't, I won't give you all of it. Romans 8, 5 through 11, just for time's sake, okay? Romans 8, 5, I'll just, let me just read the, the, the latter portion. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Before, it talked about Jesus dwelling in you, but now it's saying the spirit dwells in us. And I hope most of you know that as soon as you believe in Jesus Christ, you were born again, and the spirit came to dwell in you, Right? Well, so most of us know that. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, this is very interesting. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You know what I'm trying to show you? Most of us don't usually see these little switches. The Spirit is dwelling in you, but the Christ is in you. You know what that is? It's union with Christ. Christ is in you. And then how is Christ connected to you? The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you to connect you and unite you to this powerful life that conquered all sin and death, the new, new Adam life of Jesus. Let me give to you one more passage. Um, this is a more famous. Uh, Galatians 5, you guys are familiar with Galatians. That's the fruit of the Spirit, the works of the, the flesh. Um, so, you know, so... A lot of people get confused. It is confusing. Confusing. What's the flesh? The flesh is this. The flesh is human life with no God. <laughs> That's all it is. The human life with no Holy Spirit. No God. Your, your non-Christian friend, the one that never lies and never cheats, who's, who's like more honorable and more generous than like most of the Christians you know, they're in the flesh and they're going to die. Their righteousness is from themselves, not from God. Their wisdom is from themselves, it's not from God. They're not going to make it. I like to think of the flesh as like rotting meat. We're like rotting meat. That's why you're going to die. But you know what the spirit is? It's like if the meat has like the eternal life of God inside of it. Inside of him or her. The spirit, being of the spirit, doesn't mean... Ghostly, I'm not ghostly. You're still physical. You're still kind of meaty. You're still meaty. But now you're not merely flesh. The spirit lives inside of you, and it changes something about your mind and your heart. And he says things like this. I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, I want to say a little something. Um, Most of us tend to think of the Holy Spirit, and I think this is why union with Christ is so helpful. 
Who's our mediator? When you feel lost and lonely and cry out to God, do you just cry out to God? Or do you call out to the Holy Spirit? Let me, let me bet. 95% of you call it to Jesus. I do. I do. I'm a, I'm a professional Christian. <laughs> I call out to Jesus. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is here. But what does he do? <laughs> what does he do? And let me jump in. It says, the fruit of the Spirit. And he's like, oh, the Spirit is supposed to give us love, joy, peace, patience, God. So I'm going to get to this more tomorrow. Right? But, and those who belong to Christ Jesus, there we go again. This, there's a fruit of a spirit, but all of a sudden he shifts. You belong to Christ. You're united to Christ. What have you done? You've crucified the flesh. You've died with that. Something about you died. It was crucified. That's the flesh. But now there's something new living inside you. It's a new life in the spirit or united to Christ. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. It's interesting. You get the Spirit. I, I, when I was younger, I always thought it was very passive. It's by grace, right? And since it's by grace, it's just kind of like, hit me with it. <laughs> Lord, just hit me with it. And so there are people, like, you know, the, the Spirit-filled churches. So, like, when they go to the Spirit-filled, I mean, I'm not trying to dog on the churches because I, I love all churches that, you know, all churches are flawed, including my denomination and theology. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the things I love talking to JP. He's not afraid to, like, critique our camp. <laughs> okay? He's our team, and you're like, yeah, that part of our team kind of stinks, right? Because it's true. Because we all are this way. And yet, you know, you have certain types of folks, they call those charismatics, and what, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is like you do tongues or something. <laughs> there has to be some kind of, like, powerful manifestation, and then, and then it's like tongues. That, that's, not, that's not the main thing the Spirit does. You know what the main thing the Spirit does? It connects you to the conquering, death-conquering, resurrection, life in the man Jesus. Not just the God, Son of God Jesus, because the Son of God Jesus is now a man forever. And he's not just up there like, I'm the sovereign Son of God, and I'll just help you from up here because I'm just powerful, and I can just help you from up here. And he could, but that's not how he decided to do it. He's up there. He has a body. He has a spiritual body that doesn't die. He, do you notice? You know, that's what the story says in the Bible, right? He was crucified. He was risen. And then he didn't die again. He ascended in that body. And in that body, that humanity, that humanity, the power and life of that humanity is now we're, we're grafted into that. We're united to the life of that humanity, and the Holy Spirit has given that to us. That's union with Christ. Is that good? So I'll stop there, because that's enough, right? <laughs>